All right, good evening, church. Happy Wednesday. Is this a, a, a new ushering service for back scratches? 
Amen. It's so good to be with you tonight. Can we all stand? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm, I'm happy to announce that myself, my brother Brandon here, and four other adults, male adults, survived Pow Wow Weekend with 20 kids. Yes. We persevered. There was a little bit of crying on our part, not the kids, but no, no, it was a good time. The kids, I think, did really good, although they were a little rambunctious at times. I saw, you know, you never get to see the side of a, a, a brother in the Lord until you take him camping, and, and I, I think Brother Brandon and I kind of bonded a little bit more than we would normally do. <laughs> but you know what was good, though? We had, um, we had an evening service. I think it was the second night. I think you were with the older kids. And then they, they did an altar call. And, uh, you know, trying to get 10, 11, well, even younger, because we have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, trying to get them to focus sometimes is a little bit hard, especially when you have same age kids all around them. And it just came to a point in the service where, you know, the kind of the playing around uh, kind of playing around kind of faded away. And all of a sudden, the kids' attention just was like kind of, the, the movement stopped. Nobody said anything, but the kids, the movement stopped. And I had my eyes closed and everything, and then I opened them, and I, and I see my son Arrow praying for Bentley and, and Bailey with, uh, Bentley with his hands up. And I look, and one of the other kids is crying, and he's just kind of shaking like this. And, and another one doesn't know what to do, and all of a sudden, he just goes. You know, and, and there's moments like that that sometimes I think we take for granted when God does little things, you know. But we also think sometimes that maybe kids are too distracted or, or, or maybe whatever. But I believe something amazing happened this weekend in their lives. And um, just to be able to be with them and, and, and hang out. And let me tell you something. I've been camping before, but I got it all wrong this go around. This guy did not bring the right sleeping bags. We were freezing. But uh, that's another story for another day. But I'm glad that I got a chance to spend time with the kids and also with some of the brothers in the Lord as we kind of sat around the campfire and as iron sharpens iron she talked about the lord and we laughed we had steak it was delicious but um just uh just thankful this evening for the church that we have and the people that are that uh that are here so father god this evening we thank you first and foremost we thank you for your son father we thank you for the holy spirit we thank you father because as scripture says you never left have never left us nor forsaken us you're with us at all times Father, I thank you for, Father, the family that we have here. Father, may we never take what this church has for granted, Father. But above all, Father, may we continue to sow into it that our bonds will become stronger. Our camaraderie, Father, would be just at a level, Father, that makes others jealous and, and want to see what's going on here that's different. May we, Father, just represent the name of the sign, Father, to a level, Father, that it just uh, uh, there's an anointing on it, Lord. Father, I thank you for all those under the sound of my voice, those that are watching on Facebook tonight. Father, we dedicate this service to you. Father, there's, there's, we have a, a schedule, but at the same token, Father, we just want to be obedient. And Father, we don't want to leave the same way we came in. So Holy Spirit, just have your way tonight. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. The altars are open, as always. Let's, let's join in prayer and in worship. faithfulness tonight all throughout my history your faithfulness has walked beside me the winter storms made a way for spring and every season from where I'm standing sing it out
Shout a praise tonight.
Thank you, Lord. Pastor Omar, I feel like that little guy at the Rangers just, I don't know what else to do. Just acknowledge the presence of Jesus. Wow. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You know, I don't really want to be in a hurry tonight. And uh, maybe some of you that need a touch of the Lord, you might need healing. Uh, Pastor Cesar's here. I'm here. I'm going to call on Brandon to come up and help us. If, if any of you need prayer, if you need hands laid upon you and prayed over tonight, just, just come on down. The, the, the glory of Jesus is in this room, his anointing. Uh, come on down, my friends. And I- anyone else that needs a touch of Jesus, just, just come in faith. Just, just come in believing and, and believe that God is, is going to minister to them in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray over Pastor. Pastor Jim, I'm going to pray that this knee continues to, to uh, restore uh, and, and all of this um, irritation, the uh, pain that Pastor Jim has had in his leg now for several weeks. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just release the healing, Lord, to, to Jim in the name of Jesus, that all the, uh, all the inflammation, all of the soreness, all of the blood flow has to be turned to normal. Any swelling has to go down in the name of Jesus. The healing comes into his body. Complete freedom of movement, complete strength. Let it just flow right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I believe the Lord. We shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We shall speak in faith. We shall speak in expectation for the miracles of God. Father God, I pray over my brother tonight that's a touch of God upon his life. The miracle healing of Jesus upon his life. I believe you for it, Lord. We pray in expectation. We pray in faith and confidence right now, God, for everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I lift up Miss Linda Higgins tonight at home, and I pray that, Lord, you'd continue to touch her, raise her up in the name of Jesus. I pray that any infection will be gone from her body, that any limitation that she has physically, any communicable disease, any type of irritation, any type of problem will just be gone in the name of Jesus. Heal in the name of Jesus. Her heart longs to be in your house. Her spirit yearns to be with the people of God. And I pray that, Lord, you just release the healing touch of Jesus to come on her now in the name of the Lord from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Lord, we lift up Miss Linda's spies tonight, God. I pray the healing of Jesus and the strength of God would be upon her. I I know that she suffers in so much pain. I know the torment, it's on her body continuously. But I pray that, Lord, you will bring strength. Lay the presence of Jesus just rest over her, the wholeness over her mind, her will, her emotions. Thank you for it, God, in the name of Jesus. We just pray over Steve tonight, Lord. I know that Steve is in constant pain, and I pray over him right now in the name of Jesus that the healing of God's presence will just come into his body in the name of Jesus. Every muscle, every joint, every ligament, every tendon must turn to normal. Every presence of the organs in his body must be completely normal. We pray for that, God, in the name of Jesus. Strength to renew, strength to return. And I thank you for that, God. I praise you for it, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Jesus. Your glory, Lord, changes everything. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 We'll transition here momentarily. You don't have to be in any hurry. 
but want to make your way back to your seats. That's perfectly fine, and we'll get ready for our, our teaching time here in just a few minutes. But we need to be comfortable. We need to be familiar with the presence of Jesus like this. We don't always need to be doing something. We don't always need to be fulfilling a, 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 an agenda, a schedule. We need time to just sit and soak in the presence of the Lord. In fact, I don't know if you remember, but just two days from now, this Friday night, that's what we're going to be doing. Friday night, our uh, night of adoration. God put this on Aiden's heart some weeks ago, and he came to me and he said, Pastor, what if we do this? And I think... Yeah, well, we need to do that. So we're going to start at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going to take out two or three rows here in the front. And uh, you might want to just bring a blanket, bring a pillow. You can come sit on the floor. You say, and, and I mean this very sincerely. You say, Pastor, what if I'm here in, in just worshiping the Lord and I fall asleep? Well, I don't know about you, but that's, that's on my agenda. That's, that's what I'm praying will happen to me. Because I've had a lot of insomnia lately. I know I'm serious. And, and I'm just asking for the presence of Jesus and his rest to come over me. And so whatever you need, if, if you need to sleep in the house of the Lord, there's no better place in the presence of Jesus. And just soak up. We'll have some worship. Some of it will be live. Some of it will be pre-recorded. We don't want to overwork our musicians and all those that are leading. So we'll give them a chance to just chill as well. And uh, Aiden's going to start the night out with a, with a devotional word. And he's going to do a little bit of teaching. We'll get started at 6 o'clock. We'll do a little bit of worship in the beginning. Then, you know, an hour or so into it, we'll get that, that devotional word. And then it's just an open agenda for God's presence and His power to move in our lives. Praise God. I don't know if there's anything else we need to uh, make mention of announcement-wise. If you're our guest tonight, I'm looking around. I, I think everyone is, is home folks, but we're so, so glad that you're here tonight. Um, I'll give you a report. Let me just switch to the other mic. Thank you so much for... Uh, continuing to pray uh, for me, and I do appreciate it. Some have asked how I've been feeling and what's, what's been happening. Um, the atrial fibrillation has persisted. It, it's, it's in that uh, irregular uh, rhythm mode constantly. Um, and so uh, the result is I have a lot of fatigue. I have a lot of shortness at breath. I'm just really uh, not myself. The Lord really helps me on Sundays, and uh, the anointing of the Spirit is something that can never be um, taken for granted. But uh, apart from the anointing of the Spirit, this guy gets toasted. I mean, I just get really exhausted and uh, out of breath. If I do anything strenuous at all, it's, 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 it's a little difficult. Uh, I've been to the, the cardiologist, and they're trying to get me scheduled. Uh, to have, first of all, a stress test to make sure there are obviously no, no blockages or anything to uh, be concerned about, which we have no reason to believe that there is. And then the first uh, thing that they will do is the uh, heart, the, the shock. Um, and they, they actually try to shock your heart to get it back into a correct rhythm. So I'm, I'm really praying that we can get that appointment scheduled quickly. Uh, and we're praying that that will be very successful. There's other things that are on the um, prognosis later on if that is not successful. But I'm praying that that will be successful. I, really, I'm praying that God just heals it before we even get to that point. And, uh, and the presence of Jesus just completely uh, makes me whole. Uh, it has been, uh, I think those of you that know me, you all know me, but um, it, it's been... It's been different. This is not me. Uh, I'm the high energy. I'm the workaholic. I'm the one that never stops. And uh, this has just been very, very um, uh, humiliating, humbling, whatever words you want to use. But uh, I know God's going to bring a lot, lot of good out of it. But I am looking forward to it ending. This, this too shall pass. I tell you, this, this did not come to stay. It came to pass. You heard about the guy, didn't you? The old farmer that came to his pastor and says, I found the best verse I've ever seen in the Bible. He says, well, and it came to pass. 
<laughs> and it, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. So uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, we are as well getting ready. I've been on the phone some today uh, talking about National Day of Prayer. That's always the first Thursday of May. So that will be May the 2nd will be National Day of Prayer. We will be at the Brooksville Common again like we have been, the Ministerial Association, for the last number of years. And uh, Javin Mirabella, and myself, and others will be leading in that service. It starts at 12 noon, so we always encourage uh, our church to come. It's a one-hour outdoor service. Uh, all the different pastors are there, 20 or 30 pastors from our community, and each one takes two or three minutes to pray over a particular um, prayer point that has been assigned to them, and it's, uh, it's always a very meaningful time. So tonight we're back to our, our Bible study, and uh, we're in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we've kind of been hit and miss uh, for a little while, but this is our go-to um, series when we're not doing something else on Wednesday night. And I just want to give a shout out to my team, those that have ministered on first Wednesdays. Last week, Pastor Genesis did an amazing job. In weeks previously, we've had Pastor Bailey, we've had Pastor Michelle, uh, Pastor Meredith, Pastor Omar, uh, Mandy. Uh, everyone has just done an amazing, amazing job. Uh, and so when we're not doing something like that, we're back to our staple. We're going through the book of Hebrews. Um, this is, I believe, our 24th week or third, 23rd week, something like that, of going through the book of Hebrews. And uh, we're in chapter 10. And uh, tonight we're going to pick up in chapter 10, starting with verse number 19. Now, the next two weeks, uh, in fact, I may not be here next week, but the next two lessons on the book of Hebrews from chapter 10 are, are really going to be some, um, some tough ones, okay? I really want you to listen. I really want you to dig in. I want you to um, apply your, your mind and, 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 and ask your questions. Maybe tonight when we get towards the end, I'll try not to talk all the way to the end, so we'll have some time for some questions. But uh, these next two passages, these next section through chapter 10, uh, there, there's some... There's some um, heavy material here. This is not easy stuff. This is not, not uh, you know, Jesus loves me type stuff. This is some heavy word. So tonight, if the Lord will help us, we'll get through verse 25, verse 19 through 25. That's not too long of a passage. Let me read this, and then uh, we'll jump into it. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place uh, places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up, uh, to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting the meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So uh, when we hear the gospel, when a person hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they can make two choices, right? Uh, there, there's two options. When they hear the gospel, what are those two options? They can either draw near to God. They, they can receive the word. It's like the seed that's planted in their life. It can begin to grow. Of course, Jesus gave the master parable about the different types of soil. That's the different types of people's lives. Some is rocky soil. Some is sandy soil. Some is fertile soil. Some is soil where the uh, seed is crowded out by the weeds. But... Uh, a person has two choices. They can receive the truth of the gospel and, and they, can, they can believe it and they can move on into salvation or what is the other option? They can reject it. 
they can refuse to believe it. So these next two lessons, the first one will be on the first option, those that receive, those that draw near. And then starting at verse number 26, I don't want you to read ahead, but if you do glance down there, you'll see that verse 26 starts out really tough. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And uh, if we'll go on down through that passage in the next uh, week or so, you'll see how heavy that is. That's the person that rejects the word. That's the person that goes into what we'll call apostasy. So tonight we have the definitely the, the better of the two options. We get to talk about the person that receives. And uh, I want to quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Every one of you, I'm sure, could say this by memory, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So let's just break that down. I don't have that on the screen. But Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by what? For by grace. So we have a wonderful foundation there. We have grace. Grace is what? Unmerited favor. Grace is the undeserved favor of God. God. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. For by grace you are saved, how? Through faith. So it's by grace. Grace is what provides it. Grace is what makes it available. Grace is what gives it to us. But faith is the only way that we can access it. Anyone that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. No one receives anything from God except by faith. We get saved by faith. We receive healing by faith. We receive everything that we receive from God by faith. I, I can't teach on that right now. In fact, I'm starting to do some study. Pastor Cesar, you'll like this. Uh, the next series, after I finish more in 24 and I got two more Sundays, I'm going to start a series called The Keys to the Kingdom. And, and this is going to be a combination of a, a kingdom message, but it's also going to be a combination of faith. I've been listening to some Word of Faith guys. Come on, somebody. Get a hold of that with me. How many know we need some faith in our lives? We need to get a hold of the word of faith that in this day and age is the only thing that we have that is a sure foundation for our times. So when you talk about the keys of the kingdom, Jesus said, whatsoever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall have been loose. I'm just wetting your appetite a little bit. This is uh, right up your alley. There was never intended to be this separation between heaven and earth. There's always intended to be this, this correlation. Heaven is always intended to influence earth. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no uh, poverty in heaven. There's no, uh, you know, all the social problems of our world don't exist in heaven. So we're supposed to whatsoever we bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven where we lose. We're supposed to reach up to heaven and, and pull down to the earth. And the only way that we can do that is how? By Faith, that was my point there. In the, for by grace are ye saved through faith. So um, let's look now at our, at our passage, starting with verse 19. Therefore, brothers. Now, one of the sources I was reading today um, said that in his opinion, and I'm not sure it really would matter a whole lot, but he said that he believes the brothers here is the actual Jewish uh, brothers that the book of Hebrews is written to, not necessarily to all uh, blanket to believers, but to the, to the Jewish uh, Christians that the book of Hebrews was addressed to, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. We must, and point number one is we must do what? We must draw near. We must press in. We must, by faith, pursue the relationship we have with God. And how do we do that? By faith. 
in the blood of Jesus. He talks about the holy places that the blood of Jesus has opened. And verse number 20 is, is really cool. And uh, this is in alignment uh, with what I was taught years ago. Uh, verse number 20, by the new and living way, it would literally translate it by a freshly slain pathway. So what is the way that we have access into the presence of God? We have access through a freshly slain pathway pathway through the blood of Jesus. It's like we're walking on the blood path. We're, we're walking on the blood that made that entrance that we can come into, into uh, the presence of God. But the only way that we can get in there is, is, is what? Is, is by faith. If a person tries to go into God's presence based on their own character or their own works or their own religious affiliation, they will, they will have no, no access. In fact, uh, Matthew chapter 7 uh, says that a, people, a lot of people try all these different things. Not everyone who, not even by verbal confession, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. For many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and your name perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Because they, they uh, take words or, or whatever it is as, as the uh, ability to come in when there's only the one thing, and that is the blood of Jesus that has opened that way. Remember the last time we were in Hebrews 10, we talked about the blood of Jesus. The sacrifice was once for all, and he forever opened the pathway. He forever tore the veil, and that veil in the temple that was the limitation of uh, people's access into the presence of God, that veil in the temple is forever removed. That freshly slain pathway now is open, and we can come into the presence uh, of God. Um, the blood of Jesus is the only way that we can do that, so we must draw near. It's the new and living pathway. It's the freshly, here's the word. I don't know if you, in, in the Greek, that, that word new is prosphetos, and, and that it means a freshly slaughtered, a freshly slain pathway into the presence of God. Now, as I was reading, uh, preparing today, here was a paragraph that I thought, wow, that's really deep. So let me just read it to you. While Jesus was preaching and teaching and healing, that is, while he was alive, his flesh was a barrier to God's presence, just as was the veil in the tabernacle. An uncrucified Savior could not have saved. If Jesus had only come into the world and ministered in his flesh, he could not have been the Savior no matter how many years he would have preached or how many thousands more miracles he would have performed. As long as his flesh was alive, it was a barrier. But in the sense that only by its sacrifice could men's sins be atoned for and that way to heaven be opened. So when the physical veil of the earthly temple was torn in two during Jesus' crucifixion, that was a picture of the spiritual veil that was also torn in two by his flesh. So Jesus' uh, death literally purchased that freshly slain pathway into the presence of God. Verse 22, so let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Okay, now, um, full assurance of faith is um, like in sincerity, in, in um, devotion, in, in commitment, without, without limitation. Um, the nation uh, of Judah, like many individuals, had often come to God with anything but a sincere heart. But we must come in with a sincere heart. That is the only way that we have access into, into the presence of God. And a certain type of faith, let me just share this with you. A certain type of faith is built into human nature. Even on the purely human earthly level, we couldn't operate without it. But we have to take all of us and devote to the Lord. How, how many know that we, 
we have, um, we're, we're not, um, what would be the word? We're not spiritual schizophrenics, but we have three parts. What are we? Mind, will, our, 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 well, we're body, soul, and spirit. We know that in that sense. But then our, 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 our soul is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotions. All three have to be in agreement in order for salvation to occur. Now, if I can say this uh, to, to explain what's, what's in my mind, but if we, just, if we just believe with our mind, what's that? Just mental assent to truth. There's a lot of people, you heard me say this this way, there's a lot of people that believe in God. They, they, they mentally assent to truth. They say, oh, yes, I, I believe in God. I, I, I believe in my mind. I, I, I accept and I, I believe. But does just mental assent to truth save? No, it doesn't. What is another part of, of our being emotionally? A lot of people believe emotionally. Even if you believe mentally and emotionally, does that save? In fact, there's a piece in the Bible that gives us an illustration. James says, even the demons believe and they shudder. So the demons have, there's, there's, not, there's never anywhere an atheistic demon. You know that? It doesn't exist. All demons believe in God. They know God. They, they have seen God. They, they know the reality of God. But even though they know God and even though their emotions, because even the demons believe and they shudder, even their emotions are stirred by the presence of God, are they, can, can they be saved? Obviously, no. Not a trick question. <laughs> so what's the part that's missing? The will. So unless your mind, will, and emotions, all three are in agreement, salvation doesn't happen. But the mind, the will, and the emotions all must agree. And we must draw near to God uh, with full assurance uh, of faith with our hearts. And now here's two, two statements that um, might be a little confusing, but they'll make sense. Go to that screen. I think it says personal or, or, excuse me, positional sanctification and practical sanctification. What's sanctification? Becoming like God, being set apart. And we've taught this before when we're going through the book of Hebrews, or, or excuse me, the book of Romans. We taught that when a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment that they accept Christ and they're saved, they are positionally sanctified, Right? They have a standing in righteousness. Um, in the sight of God, they are as saved as they'll ever be. They're as saved as the day that they arrive in the presence of God because they are positioned in Christ. Now, it's kind of unique the way the writer of the Hebrews says this uh, kind of in symbolic language, but notice what he says in verse 22. Let, our, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. So there's the positional sanctification. We're ceremonially clean. The conscience is cleansed before God. We, we have a standing in righteousness. But even though we are positionally sanctified, how many know sometimes practically we are far, we are far away from where we are positionally? Even though I am in Christ, and even though the Apostle Paul would teach that I am perfected in Christ, yet I have not arrived yet to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. And he's still working on me. I've got a long ways to go. So he says that I'm positionally sanctified because my heart is sprinkled with clean, uh, is, my heart is sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, but I'm in the process of being practically sanctified because my body is also being washed with pure water. So it's kind of unique the way he just in one verse symbolically kind of reminds us that positionally we're sanctified the moment we accept Christ, but 
the practical process of sanctification is an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So then verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us, and now here we have this passage that is, uh, I think, very applicable to today's world and very important. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So what would be the uh, practical explanation of verses 24 and 25? Just, just reading those, verse 24 and 25, what would that tell us about the days and the times in which we live? It would tell us that we need one another today more than we've ever needed each other before. And, and we need to be in the fellowship with each other more and more than we've ever needed, all the more as you see the day approaching. And yet, what do we see on a practical level? And if you know me, you know this is something that really stirs me up because we have more and more people in our world today that uh, want to practice a uh, concept of, of um, a relationship with Christ but don't believe like they need to be plugged in to a body of Christ anywhere. And that's that age-old question that it just as you know, irritates the fire out of me. Well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You know, it's just like, how do you answer a, a silly question like that? How, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't have to go to eat McDonald's to get a Happy Meal, but it's a whole lot better when it's hot than when it's cold. <laughs> go on. So, you know, but how, how do you answer that? And uh, this, this really deals with that, meaning that, the reason that we are encouraged to plug in and be involved and, and be connected to one another is that, look at verse 24, let us consider how to stir one another, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. What is the real um, foundation for what he's saying there for not neglecting meeting together. It's not always so much that I need to get something out of it as it is that I might have something that I can contribute to someone else. Really, those that, um, and this is a cutting statement, but uh, it wouldn't be too far for me to, to use it on occasion. It'd be like some people would say, I, I really just love Jesus, but I hate his body. So it's like, ooh, that, that, that's a strong word, isn't it? I, I really just love Jesus, but I don't like his church. I don't like his people. So what is the real foundation of here, what he was saying? It's not so much that we have to go to church because we're going to come to get something, but we have an opportunity to go because maybe there's something in us that can contribute to someone else. Let us consider how to stir one another on to love and good deeds. We may have something that we need to, to give and to contribute. So it's not just that we have to come as a legalistic thing because, well, the Bible says, you know, that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold and people will wax worse and so on. No, that, that's true. But the point is that we have opportunity to be a blessing, to minister uh, to others. So that's that first section. Now, I didn't know if we would get to this, and I'm not going to get all the way through it tonight, but I do want to give you the foundation to the next section. And uh, you'll have to go to the other set of notes in the back. This could be a cell separate week, but let's just roll it into the same one tonight, and I'll lay the foundation, then we'll go into it deeper next time. Verse 26 starts that other option that I mentioned in the beginning, that someone doesn't draw near to Christ. They don't receive. They, they don't accept with mind, will, and emotions. They, they don't get their whole being uh, into the presence of God, walking into that freshly slain pathway, the riven uh, veil in the temple being destroyed and coming into the presence of God. But this is now the opposite result of a person, and the word that we're going to use to explain this is apostasy. 
or rejecting Christ. So let me just read the passage, and this will get your um, this will get your minds stirring, and then uh, we'll just kind of let this marinate for a, a little while. For if we go on sinning, and uh, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that what he just said in verses 24 and 25 about not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing is followed up by the statement, and if we deliberately go on sinning. So I really think that there is an application there to that warning. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him, him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again says, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I'm going to stop reading there. Uh, when we cover all this, um, we'll get all the way through the next section. We'll go on from verse 32, probably the next time that we work on this. But this is the whole passage now about apostasy. And uh, it opens the door to, uh, is it possible for a person to uh, lose their salvation? Uh, what about the doctrine of once saved, always saved? What about a person that... Um, you know, has, has walked away from God? What about a person that has turned their, their back on God? And, and all of that w will be uh, very uh, clearly uh, addressed in this passage. And, and let me say before we even start going into it, if you were to draw a timeline and you got, you know, the keeping power of God over here, uh, that, you know, you got a lot of people that quote, a God is mightier than all, and no one can pluck you out of the hand of God, and all the grace verses and all of the, the verses about the um, perseverance of the saints, all that is over here. And then you got way over here in the other uh, extreme, you got the real old school legalistic doctrine that every time you stumble, you lose your salvation, you get your... Uh, name blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life, and then you got to repent, and, and you plead and beg God for him to write you back in. And my illustration is if you've ever worked in an office and you use whiteout, I think that's a pretty good illustration. The Lamb's Book of Life, the pages get to be six inches thick because of that gooey stuff that God blots your name out of the book. And, and then you come and you repent, so he writes your name back in. And then, you, oh, you had a bad thought. You, 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 uh, you hit your... Uh, thumb with a hammer and a curse word came out. So God blots your name back out of the book and then you got to, and then you came to church and he was on Easter Sunday and one of the other sisters had on the same exact same dress that you bought on Saturday night at Kohl's and, and, and you are so excited about wearing that brand new dress but they had and, and you were just so angry and, and you showed a bad spirit. God blotted you back out but then on Wednesday night you repented and, and you came back and, and you asked for forgiveness and so are, are you with me? You know, these two extremes, okay, if you take these two extremes, if you really want to know, and I'm telling you the, 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 the real sincere truth, where Pastor Coates is on, on those two extremes, I would be like right here about, 90, about 99%, okay? I, I'm not over here thinking that every time we, you know, have a bad thought or every time we have a bad day or every time we... Um, say something we shouldn't say or whatever, that, that we lose our salvation, then we have to repent and get all saved all over again. I believe in the keeping power of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. I, I'm a son. Even it, those of us, obviously, that are parents, when our children uh, 
make mistakes, we don't throw them out of the family. We discipline them, we correct them, but we nurture them, but we don't throw them out of the house. We don't throw them out to the wolves. So I would be, now, am I going to say that I can't lose my relationship with God? No. I'm going to leave that one, two, three, four, five percent. I'm going to leave that, that thing over there. The apostasy can still happen. But I'm not going to be in the camp all the way over here that, that causes me to walk on eggshells all the time and thinking that I'm going to you know, mess up and, and lose my relationship with God. But I am going to, and this passage deals with that element that's way over there that's called apostasy. And uh, this is one of the five uh, passages in the beginning. We laid these out, the five passages that are the warnings in the book of Hebrews. I think on the next screen, we have all five of those uh, listed. Uh, there's five major warnings in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he gave us the warning about drifting from the Word of God. And that was the idea that you keep the ship tied to the dock, rather it drifts out to sea and it begins to be lost. Then in chapter 3, and there's a progression in these. You can see that it gets more intense, it drifting from the word and then doubting the word and then having a dullness towards the word. And this is the one that we're in tonight, uh, a person that begins to despise the word and then ultimately is the, the final warning about defying the, the word of God. So uh, this is the one that as a person begins to despise the word, they can come into apostasy. Now, it's interesting because I use a lot of materials to, to study from, and uh, one of the persons that I like to read from and, and study from is a person that, that we would uh, call a, uh, a Calvinist. Uh, I read from him. He has a lot of great things, uh, and as on certain subjects, you got to just realize that he's going to have a particular bent on philosophy on that, and you just have to accept that. But uh, a lot of material that I was reading uh, today was, was from him, and even he leaves this door open for this thing called apostasy. Now, his philosophy is that if a person walks away from God, if a person turns their back on God, then it's obvious in their philosophy that, well, they were never saved to start with. That's, that's the answer that, that they always give. Well, they were just uh, never really saved to start with. And like in John 15, where Jesus talks about the uh, branches that wither and die and they're picked up. and that, Well, those were wannabe branches. They, they looked like branches and they appeared to be branches, but they were never, they were never ever tied to the tree in the first place. Now, we can't accept that philosophy because there's just too many other scriptures that, that just do not let you hold on to that philosophy. We, we do totally believe that it is possible. I don't like to word, use the word lose your salvation, but it is entirely possible to forfeit your salvation, to walk away from your salvation, to become apostate. And, and so let's just kind of uh, use that word for a moment, um, apostasy. Uh, and I'll just give you the introduction, and um, this will leave the door open for the next time that we talk. Uh, the nature of apostasy is that it is an, int an intentional falling away or withdrawal or a defection, intentional um, apostasy. No one is going to turn their back on God um, accidentally. No, no one is going to become an apostate without realizing it. No one is going to wake up one morning and, and say, oh, what happened? I'm no longer a Christian. I, I'm no longer saved. I'm, I'm no longer, um, you know, um, I lost my salvation overnight. Like I wake up in the morning and I can't find my car keys. I wake up in the morning and I, I can't find my salvation. That, that, that's, that's just a silly way to look at it. But it is an intentional falling away or, or turning away or a withdrawal. You remember in the uh, book of Revelation, Jesus said uh, to the one church, the problem is that you have left your first love. He didn't say you lost your first love. He said you left your first love. You made a series of intentional decisions, and step by step, you gradually became 
further and further and further away from the truth. Um, so apostasy is in an intentional falling away, withdrawal, or a defection. Um, clearly, that, that can happen. Uh, clearly, uh, we probably all have known people. And uh, it, it, would be, it would be one philosophical cop-out to say, well, they were never saved to start with, or, or they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have turned away. But in all reality, that, that explanation just doesn't really suffice it intellectually. Because we've known people. I've known people. You've known people. They were saved as I'm saved. They, probably more so. <laughs> they, they, they were fruitful. They were doing things for God. There, there was evidence of the Spirit of God working in their life. It was undeniable. But over a series of, of time, of years or, or months or a period of time, um, things begin to happen. Things, choices begin to make, decisions, and, and things started moving in, in the wrong direction. Now, no one, myself, first of all, on the, on the top of the list, no one could ever try to assume to explain when they cross that line. I, I don't know. That, that's between them and God. But somewhere along the line, there is a line to be crossed. That There is a, a point where the relationship with God is, is no longer valid. And at that point, we again not use the word they've lost their salvation, but they have literally neglected it. They have uh, forsaken it. They have literally abandoned it. And at that point, they would become uh, a person that, that, that the Bible, that the scriptures would explain as uh, falling into apostasy, uh, no longer believing what they once believed. And uh, we'll get into that more uh, next time. But I wanted to slow down here before we actually finish because there's a lot I know that, that comes uh, to mind on, on this subject. So let's kind of just stop here and see if there's some uh, questions that we can um, deal with or any um, feedback. Um, the whole idea of... Um, you know, this apostasy is um, obviously something that um, the Bible warns about. And the Bible wouldn't warn us about it if it wasn't a, a very real possibility. Um, now, when everybody gets quiet, it makes me very nervous because it's like, I've either said it very well that everybody's very clear or I've said it so poorly that no one has any idea what in the world I've been talking about. So hopefully it's the former, not the latter. Okay, yes. Sure. 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 
Sure. Sure. And there's no doubt all of us have stories like that of people that we know that um, are not where they uh, once were. And uh, I think the answer for that is for us to pray uh, for them. Uh, I've said this many times, America, and this is, I think, a good word for, for evangelism, Aiden. Uh, America is not really an unevangelized nation. I mean, it is more that way than it used to be. And in the future, more and more secularism, more and more atheism, more and more humanism, it's certainly going to uh, continue to move that direction. But historically, at least in my generation, different from your generation, but uh, my generation was not an unevangelized generation. Uh, the baby boomer generation. Uh, America is not an unevangelized culture. America is a backslidden culture. America is an apostate culture. Uh, having, having known the truth, having in many cases had a relationship with God or at least known the truth intellectually, whether they had experienced it personally or not, yet they, they knew it and it was taught and, and preached. And it is very much a, a backslidden uh, generation, uh, a backslidden nation. Uh, which is a, a good opportunity because we can pray that God will use that root that is there to bring back to their remembrance the things that, that once were and, and stir them up to, to repentance and to salvation. Sure. Sure. And that's where a lot of people fall short. They didn't build it off of a burning heart of love. They built it off of um, because he saved me or because he healed me. And that's just not going to cut it. You have to love people. Sure. There has to be the foundational love. And, and the way that we access that is by faith. And that's the whole being, the mind, the will, the emotions, the whole being uh, crying out to God. So the nature of apostasy is a um, having known the truth, but it was a, I wouldn't say even say willful. It, it's willful in the sense, it's not like they woke up one morning and said, I'm going to decide to give up on God. But they made decisions, they were deceived, made choices that allowed the different things to, to I'm trying to quote the, the verse of Jesus, uh, somebody help me. Uh, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and there's one more phrase that Jesus said in that, in that statement. But all those things uh, begin to, to impact people's lives. I think you mentioned it, um, you know, it goes back to faith, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's, it's kind of a nickel and diming over time. You know, one, one perceived prayer not answered, one offense not uh, uh, given over to the Lord and forgiven. Sure. And little by little, and you know, that's one of the scriptures that comes to mind is the renewing of the mind is setting our, so, our, our minds on, on things above because if you focus on those things too long, you start creating environments in your heads and, and, and pathways and, and thought process. And, and, and in essence, you start creating your own theology that begins to fight against the very nature of who God is because if God was this, then he would do this. And if God was this, then he would have shown up here. And when he doesn't show up, then it's we in our own mind start reducing his power, reducing his authority, 
We remove the cross, and when the cross is gone, so is our heart for him. Mm-hmm. So we have to be very careful and guard our hearts. And, and I'll be totally vulnerable. There's been seasons in my life where those kind of discussions have come into my head. I know the scriptures, and, I, and I've set my heart on something, and God has flipped the script on me. But in that season, I was like, God, where were you? And so you start, and, and the first thing that is, is, is condemnation. Well, it's because of me. I don't love enough. I don't have faith enough. I didn't do enough. And, and the minute we start that process, the enemy comes in with all these other things and begins to affirm those thoughts. And that's why I believe that a lot of times it's important for us. You know, the, the Holy Spirit didn't come to condemn us in, when we are tempted or when we sin. He came to be a helper to help us overcome. So right. rather than running from him in those moments, and I know it's easier said than done, it's when we run to him. Because the clarity of thought, heart, and mind is only found in his, in his arms. And, and there's a, a reprogramming, a rebooting that needs to occur. If not, we'll go down a pathway. I heard a pastor say this one time in a, in a season that he was in. He said the Lord very clearly said to him, you're digging a pit so deep in your mind that my right hand won't even be able to get you. Hmm. Because he had locked himself in his head and started creating theologies that spoke against God himself. And, and, and God delivered him from that, but... You know, it's, it's that renewing of the, the mind and being very cautious of our thought process. Well, our, t- our time is gone, and I wanted to just lay this out tonight kind of just easy and, and just kind of let it settle in your mind. And so the next time, we'll go through the verses and we'll outline all these points that have to do with, with apostasy. But again, uh, leaving it in the book, as, as much as we would like to tear this page out of the book, as much as we'd like to uh, erase the 2 or 3 or 4 percent, what, whatever my analogy is, uh, obviously I'm going to never live over there. I'm never going to go over there and, and live in, in fear and in um, uh, uh, condemnation, thinking that, you know, today I wasn't perfect, so that means I've lost my salvation. That, that's, that is, there's therefore now no condemnation in the name of Christ Jesus, but as close as we can, we do have to leave that door open over here because the Bible leaves it open. And uh, I'll just let you go with close with this. But um, a, a lot of philosophies, theologies, whatever, comes down to a lot of people that do adhere to the once saved, always saved. You cannot backslide. You cannot lose your salvation. What the reality is, they, they believe their doctrine more than they believe the Bible because the Bible literally leaves that door open. We don't want that door open. We don't want to get close to that door. We, we'd like to not even have to deal with it, but the Bible leaves it open. The Bible does say that that is a possibility that must be guarded against. So, yeah. Mark 4, 18 and 19. Now, these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in to choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Yeah, that's it. So let's stand together tonight, and that's why uh, times like Friday night are, are so important. Uh, bring your hearts Friday night. Br- bring your bring your list. Bring your bring your uh, list of people that that you know in your life that are not where they need to be with God, and just spend time on the carpet waiting before the Lord, calling their name out to God, and asking the Holy Spirit to to draw them back to Jesus. Father, I thank you tonight that uh, we can be kept by the word of God, but we also thank you that the word does warn us that apostasy is a very uh, real possibility. Let us not be deceived into thinking that these philosophies of of um, of uh, just safety and security eliminate the possibility. We don't want to go there, obviously, and uh, we pray against it in our lives or in anybody else's life, but we have to ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, let the Word of God be the final authority, and the Word of God does keep the door open that it is a possibility that must be guarded against very consistently. So bless the people tonight. Give us your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.